All right, welcome everybody to Finding Truth. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And uh, I really appreciate the fact that you all took the time to be here tonight. Uh, tonight we have a very special guest. She has been on my channel a few times and she's quite amazing. I really like her. She's one of my favorite philosophers. Um, <laughs> and I'm a big fan and she has a book coming out too, uh, coming out here soon. So uh, if you guys keep an eye out for that. Um, I wasn't planning on saying that, but hey, um, I really think that that book is going to be important. It seems like it, uh, as far as like looking at the menu and all that stuff, like all, uh, well, the table of content, and um, it looks pretty good. So, uh, Dr. Liz, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself for those who may not know who you are, and then we'll ju jump right into the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, I always enjoy our conversations also. So, my name is Liz Jackson Withorn. Um, I got married about a year ago. Uh, and I teach philosophy at Ryerson University, which is a school in Toronto. Um, I did my PhD in philosophy at Notre Dame, and I graduated in 2019. And then before that, I ta uh, sorry, did my bachelor's degree in philosophy at Kansas State University. Um, and I guess just really quickly, my research is mostly in two areas. It's in epistemology, so the study of knowledge, rational belief, and then also in philosophy of religion, where I focus a lot on faith and also on Pascal's wager. And I think we might touch a little bit on both of those topics today. All right, so um, I guess like one of the things that, that I was thinking about is, um, I, I already had a conversation about the street epistemology, but I wanted to see your perspective as far as like how a street epistemology is used um, like within the realm of you know people that go out and perhaps either um, use it at a college uh, whenever they encounter college students or something like that or even online yeah absolutely um i'm blanking on the name of the person who you had that other conversation with but i did listen to it and i i thought it was really good so uh for those watching who was that who was that conversation with again was it daniel something or yeah that conversation was with daniel ray Daniel Ray, thank you, yes. So go, you guys should go check that out. I thought it was super helpful. Lots of really good info there. Um, and he kind of, Daniel, I think it seems like he sort of specializes more on the street epistemology side of things. Uh, whereas maybe, you know, my expertise is more in the epistemology side of things, but I have, uh, you know, I've read part of Peter Bogushin's book on it and then watched some videos of street epistemology. So I did a little bit of, of homework uh, before this video. So. My understanding, although Santa, you should feel free to fill in any gaps here, um, is basically that street epistemology is a movement. It's started by someone named Peter Bogushin, if that's how you say it, who actually teaches philosophy, I think, at Portland State University. But um, my sense is that Peter's actually not super involved in the movement anymore, although I could be wrong about that. He's kind of uh, more focusing on other things now, but it's definitely still... A movement that is very active and I think they're doing stuff on YouTube and um, a lot of people are, are kind of interested in it and involved in it and the way that Peter who's the founder of the movement explains it is he 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 says in his book street epistemology is an activist approach for helping people overcome their faith um so basically in practice what what this looks like is they go up to a Christian or someone a religious person i guess it doesn't have to just be christians um usually on like a college campus but you know it could be elsewhere to kind of go up to them and they just ask them a bunch of questions um but i do think i, I mean the questions part i don't have as much of a problem with uh what i'm not as excited about is that they have this goal of revealing to this religious person basically that they don't have good evidence for their faith or for their religious beliefs um so you know not excited about that i do want to though say something positive about it and that's this I, I like that they're focused on asking questions rather than just going up to people and saying, let me just tell you X, Y, Z, da, 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 da. Um, and so I'm a huge advocate for, for listening to people, trying to understand other perspectives, trying to understand the perspective of someone who disagrees with you. And I just think all of this is an important part of having good conversations and disagreeing well. So I don't necessarily object to that. Um, I even actually heard, I, I watched a few videos of people actually doing street epistemology, 
And one of the guys who was who was giving a commentary on uh, this street epistemology thing he had done said, I don't want to have a battle with him. I want to understand him. And I actually thought that was really great. So, I, you know, I, I want to say we don't need to, uh, just because we disagree with them, we don't need to hate on everything that they do. I think that aspect of street epistemology is good. Um, that said, <laughs> that doesn't mean that there aren't problems with street epistemology. I think there are a number of problems. So I think that's kind of what we're going to dive into next. All right. Uh, so one of the things that I was thinking about as well is like uh, like some of the presuppositions that are involved within uh, street epistemology. And that would be like, for example, um, you know, when you read the book, um, I think it may be in the first chapter that he talks about faith and he gives definitions of faith um, that um, in a certain way you will say, well, those are presuppositions and that he has about what faith is. And then he uses those presuppositions to um, basically ask the question, um, is faith a good epistemic tool? Um, so what are some of the, 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 the presuppositions that you found and, and how do you think they uh, basically kind of like uh, affect the way that people look at religious people, like, you know, how, how the people that do history epistemology look at somebody like me who is a believer of God um, or a Christian. And um, like, how do you think that affects the, the, the way they view us, I guess? Yeah. So in um, Peter Bogushin's book, he basically gives two definitions of faith. So the first is belief without evidence. And then the second is pretending to know something that you don't know. Um, okay, <laughs> so in terms of the presuppositions involved, yeah, you're right. I think this is a super, super problematic way to understand faith. And this is not at all how I would define faith. And I think how a lot of people, I think a lot of people would not define faith this way. How would I define faith? Well, um, here's, a, here's a, a basic definition. It's a commitment to someone or something that involves a belief-like state and a desire-like state. Um, so I'll give an example. So let's say I have faith that you're gonna win your upcoming basketball game. Um, I have a commitment to you and your team, and that involves me believing you'll win or thinking it's likely you're gonna win, and also me wanting you to win, desiring you to win. So that's what I think faith is. Um, I think there's no sense at all in which it would be accurate to say that faith is belief without evidence or pretending to know something that you don't. Um, and in the sense that I'm interested in faith, I think it's a great epistemic tool. Um, a lot of people think not only is faith a virtue, but it's also an important part of everyone's lives, not just religious people. Um, so people need to have faith in themselves, faith in their spouse, faith in their friends. They even have faith in like ideals they uphold. Like you might have faith in democracy or faith um, in, you know, a certain moral theory. Or, you know, there's a ton of different things we can have faith in. It's not just a religious thing. I mean, it is a religious thing. But I think faith is this super important state. And one reason I think it's so epistemically important is because faith enables us to keep our commitments over time. When we make a commitment, this could be a religious commitment, but it could be a host of other commitments as well. It could be a marriage. It could be a commitment to get healthy and start working out. It could be a commitment to finish a degree or a commitment to pick up a new instrument. There's a ton of different things we could, you know, file under this, this idea of commitment. Um, sometimes when we make these commitments, we get counter evidence. So we get evidence that makes it seem like we should not have made this commitment, whether it's like evidence that God doesn't exist, maybe evidence that you actually shouldn't have, you know, married this person, evidence that you're not going to be able to get up and go running every morning, you know, whatever that evidence is. And then faith, whether it's faith in ourselves, faith in God, faith in someone else, enables us to continue in that commitment, even when we get some level of counter evidence. So I think faith plays this crucial role in helping us keep our commitments over time. Um, commitments are a super important thing, very important feature of our lives. And I think faith can play this role. Pl it plays this role in both religious and non-religious people's lives. <laughs> um, okay, so that's sort of a little bit of my view of faith, why I think it's important. Let's say, like, maybe if Peter heard this or something, he would just say, no, 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 that's just not what I'm talking about, okay? Okay. 
So maybe there's commitments, you know, whatever. We can agree with a lot of what you said, but that's not what faith is. Faith is just, you know, a belief without evidence or, you know, pretending to know something that you don't. And one question, and it's in some ways even a practical question, what do you say to someone when they just try to define faith that way? And here's what I would say. I would say, okay, okay, sure. We can give you the word faith. There's no point in fighting over a word. It's just a word. You can call faith belief without evidence, okay? Maybe I have something else and I can give a different word to that, right? But if you want to say faith is belief without evidence, then the whole big interesting question (laughs) becomes, do theists or do religious people have faith? And on the definition of faith, where it's just belief without evidence, I would say no. So you can define faith as belief without evidence, but then all the interesting questions just get pushed to another point, which is, are religious people believing things without evidence? Um, And I think that they're not. I have a whole paper, actually, uh, where I argue for this. Santi and I actually already did an interview about it. It's called The Nature and Rationality of Faith. So you can see there for more. But one of the most important points here is that we have to be clear on what counts as evidence. And one problem, so people, at least in Peter's circles, I don't want to make any claims about Peter himself, tend to think of evidence super narrowly. So they think of evidence as something like scientific evidence or things we can prove or demonstrate using scientific or empirical methods. And the problem with that is that's just a super, super narrow view of evidence. And there's so many things that count as evidence uh, that should be evidence that don't fit under that that definition. So the evidence we have for moral truths, for philosophical theories, for even assumptions that underlie science, like induction, which is the idea that the future will be like the past. All of these things are things that I think they would want to say we have evidence for. But if you have this really narrow understanding of evidence, you can't explain how those things would be justified. Um, So, you know, let's just, going, going along this this path where we say, okay, sure, faith is belief without evidence. Um, If our goal in in street epistemology, let's just say, is to help people not have faith, um, maybe that goal isn't so bad after all, but then their target is totally off. Like, then they're just assuming that, well, then we need to convert people out of their religious beliefs. And I don't know why why we should think that, because I actually think religious people do have good evidence for their beliefs. Um, So, you know, when... Maybe when we get to the next question, we can say a little bit more about that. But basically what I want to do is kind of explain why on the two major epistemological theories, which is internalism and externalism, I think most theistic beliefs, it can, we can explain how that they're rational. Okay, so I guess um, when you were saying all those things, one of the things that also comes to mind, it has to do with justification of a belief versus being able to articulate such belief. And the reason uh, why I asked that question or like, like you know, the difference between the t- those two things is because um, somebody already brought it up in the chat that basically uh, street epistemology doesn't really particularly attack any religion, but rather it just asks questions. Mm-hmm. And I think that the idea behind it has to do with, okay, um, sometimes at some points, like, you know, if you can't justify your belief or something like that or explain it, uh, then, you know, it, it ought to cause some sort of doubt and perhaps even, like, you know, lead you to to kind of, like, leave, like, leave that belief behind. So what is the difference between justification of a belief and being able to articulate it? Yeah, that's a great question. And just really quickly on the chat, I guess, um, you know, yeah, so maybe if I said that they're just trying to get rid of all religious belief, that might not be charitable, but they are definitely very clear that they're against this idea of religious faith. And um, Peter even says he defines straight epistemology as the activist approach to helping people overcome their faith. So, um, you know, maybe we could agree that like, yeah, we don't want beliefs without evidence, but I think that they would think a lot of religious people are believing in their religion without evidence. And that's where I guess I would just, I would just disagree. Um, so, so yeah, um, as to your question, so the difference between a belief being justified 
And then being able to explain or articulate to someone else why you have that belief. I think this is a super important question, especially when it comes to street epistemology, because street epistemologists, like the person said in the chat, they are going up to people, asking questions, trying to get them to explain or articulate why they believe certain things often, you know, that God exists, that Christianity is true or something like that. Um, but I think one really, like, this is why this distinction is so important, because I could be justified in having a certain belief. That doesn't mean I'm going to be able to articulate that justification or convince you that that thing is true. So I have a couple examples. Here's, here's a first example. Take a child, and let's say you ask the child, who's your father? And then the child says, that's my, that's my dad right there, you know? Um... The child, it seems very clear that the child knows that that person is, is his father. But the child could not give you an argument for that. I don't think the child could convince someone who is skeptical, convince a skeptic that that person's my father. It seems like it's something that they know in a kind of basic way. But just because the child can't produce an argument or articulate reasons doesn't mean that that child doesn't know that that's his father. And most epistemologists think that children and animals can definitely know things, um, but that doesn't mean they can articulate those things. But I think this doesn't just apply to children and animals. So here's another example. Let's say you spent your whole day uh, working in your garden outside by yourself. And then there's a knock at your door and the cops are there. And they say, you've been accused of a murder. It occurred earlier today. And we even have someone who said that they witnessed the murder and saw you kill this person. Okay, so you were in the garden by yourself. Let's say um, no one saw you in the garden. So you know you didn't do it. You have this distinct memory. You were gardening all day. It is unquestionable you are not the murderer, right? But that doesn't mean you're going to be able to prove to the cops or prove to a jury that you didn't do it. And so both of these examples show that we can be justified in believing something, but that doesn't mean we'll be able to give arguments for it or articulate the reason that we believe it. And I want to talk now, so I give some examples. Now I want to talk a little bit more theoretically about sort of two main views of epistemic justification. So what's epistemic justification? It's basically just when you have a good reason to believe something, when your belief is justified or rational or you rightfully hold it. Okay, <clears throat> so two main views. The first is internalism. It's also known as evidentialism. And on this view, when you're justified in believing something, it's because you have evidence for that thing. But remember what we just talked about um, evidence goes beyond just scientific evidence. It also might not always be shareable, right? So if I experience a pain in my leg, you know, I can tell you like I'm in pain, but you can't like experience the pain directly in the same way that I can. You can only experience it indirectly by me telling you that, there, that I have pain, right? Um, but the point is on evidentialism, we, we need to take an expansive account of what counts as evidence. Many, many things count as evidence. And most evidentialists think that if something seems true to you, that's at least some evidence that that thing is true. And so given we have this expansive conception of evidence, um, we don't have to be able to, you know, si like say off the cosmological or ontological argument in order to be justified to believe that God exists and even in order to know that God exists. Um, there's lots of other things. So you might think about it this way. Here's the circle of things that count as evidence and arguments are a subset of that circle. But if I like look outside and see a tree, I have good evidence that there is a tree there and I'm justified to believe there's a tree there. Um, even if I, I'm not like forming an argument in my brain saying like premise one, I, I, it seems that there's a tree there. Premise two, if it seems that there's a tree, then there's a tree. Premise three or conclusion, therefore there's a tree. No, I'm just believing it immediately on the basis of a perception. So there's, you know, perceptions and intuitions and seemings and all these different things that count as evidence. So on this view, 
you know, religious experiences or testimony of religious people or testimony of religious leaders. All of these things count as evidence, seemings that God exists, going out into nature and just having this really strong feeling like there's a creator. Those all count as evidence for theism. And so you don't have to be able to give an argument in order to be rational to believe that God exists. Okay, so sorry, this is getting a little long. I'm almost done. That's internalism. Then there's externalism. Externalism is the view that what justifies or rationalizes a belief isn't something that's internally accessible to you, like evidence, but it's something about the way your brain is working or functioning. So you might think a belief is justified when it's produced by a reliable process. Me looking at um, a large object in the middle of the day in good lighting is a reliable process. Me looking at a super far away blurry object when it's dark outside is not a reliable process. So most of my beliefs produced by the first process are justified, but many of my beliefs produced by the second aren't. And I may not always be aware of all the processes going around in my brain. This is why it's called externalism. Um, but nonetheless, the whole point of externalism is you don't have to be aware of what's going on in order to be justified. And the, the actually, so, so Alvin Plantinga is one of the main people who argues uh, that you don't have to have an argument in order to be justified in believing in God. And he was an externalist. And what his story was is that there's a part of our brains, and he called it the sensus divinitatis. And the sensus divinitatis is responsible for forming beliefs about God. It's something that God put into our minds. And when that's functioning properly, we're going to form beliefs about God, especially in certain situations, like when we're out in nature and seeing the beauty of God's creation, or when we're um, maybe when we're in a, in a difficult time calling out to God for help. And in these situations, our sensus divinitatis is activated. And since that's a reliable process that is functioning well, assuming that it is, then we can reliably produce beliefs about God. So why did I just talk about all of this internalism and externalism? The point is that there are situations where on both of these theories, a belief is totally justified and totally rational, and specifically the belief in God, um, but you don't have to be able to give a bunch of arguments or a bunch of evidence uh, in order to be justified in that belief. That doesn't mean you don't have arguments, doesn't mean you don't have evidence, that evidence might just not be shareable in the same way that you have evidence that you didn't commit this murder, but you can't articulate that to the police. And so, look, I mean, straight epistemology and asking questions, I'm not necessarily against that, but there does seem to be this presupposition that if you can't answer this person asking you questions about why you believe in God, then that belief is irrational. And that's the inference that I'm trying to, to deny and, and show that on these major epistemological theories, just because you can't show why you believe something doesn't mean you don't know it. So knowability doesn't entail showability. Okay, that's good. Um, will you mind uh, kind of like define what you mean by uh, being epistemically rational? Uh, just for those who may not know what you mean by that. Yeah, so when you're epistemically rational, you hold a belief on a good basis. You have good reasons to believe it. So let me give some examples. Beliefs that are well supported by your evidence, beliefs that are reliably formed, beliefs that are a result of a good process of inquiry, um, those would be epistemically justified. Um, beliefs that are not epistemically justified are, are, are bad beliefs, right? Uh, beliefs that are not a result of a reliable process, beliefs that are formed by wishful thinking, um, believing something just because you want it to be true, these are gonna be beliefs that are not epistemically justified. And a lot of people think part of knowing something is being epistemically justified. So it's not that you can know things, um, so sorry, you can be epistemically justified in things that you don't know because you can be epistemically justified in believing things that are false, for example, but it does play this important role in knowledge and it's kind of putting you on the path towards knowing. Okay, that's good. Um, I do notice that there's quite a few people in the Finding Truth channel. So if you guys want to join us, uh, you can come and join us and explain international. And that was just uh, something that I wanted to say 
Um, so all of us can have a conversation. There's quite a few people going back and forth uh, in the Explain International. So if you guys want to join the conversation, you guys can uh, just go to uh, the link that I posted in Finding Truth and uh, you guys can uh, jump in there. Um, anyway, so uh, Dr. Liz, uh, another question that I had is like, what is the difference between credence and belief? Uh, and I think that that's a very important question. So I'll just let you uh, explain that to us. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And I think this actually does play a role in some street epistemology stuff too. This is actually the topic of my dissertation. So it's it's one of the topics I like to talk about the most, but I'll try to keep it brief. So basically when we're thinking about ways we represent the world, I think there's two main ways we do it. One, one way is the belief way. So when it comes to belief, there's basically three main attitudes we can take to any statement or proposition. We can believe it, basically saying it's true. So if I believe it's raining, I'm basically saying it's the case that it's raining, it's true that it's raining. We can disbelieve it, basically saying it's false. So if I disbelieve it's raining, I'm saying it's not raining, it's false that it's raining. Or we can withhold belief. When we withhold belief, we don't take a stand either way. So I'm withholding belief on whether there's an even number of hairs on my head. I'm not going to say it's true, but I'm not going to say it's false. Or whether there's an even number of stars in the sky. Or whether this coin that I'm about to flip is going to land heads. Those are all things I withhold belief on. So we have these basically these three attitudes. We have belief, we have withholding, and we have disbelief. And a lot of epistemologists kind of work in this framework. But I think there's another framework that sort of helps us tell an, an even more complete story about how we represent the world. And this framework um, is often known as uh, like credences or the credence framework, I guess. And so in the credence framework, what they basically do is they represent your confidence that a proposition is true on a scale from zero to one. So zero is like, I'm positive, I'm certain that it's false. And then one is like, I am 100% certain that it's true. And then you can have credences all in between, right? So my credence that it will rain tomorrow um, might be like 0.9 if there's a 90% chance of rain. My credence that a coin will land heads would be 0.5. Um, my credence that, uh, I'm trying to think of another example, uh, a Republican will win the next election is probably also around 0.5. So you can and, and one thing to note, too, is you can believe two things, but have different credences in them. So I believe, let's say I believe it will rain tomorrow. There's a 90% chance of rain. I also believe one plus one equals two, even though my credence in that is one. So basically, there's these three belief attitudes. And then your credences are this more specific attitude that sort of represents how confident you are. But it's a lot, it's like more fine-grained is the way that philosophers might say it. It's like this thinner, more specific thing. And your credences can change, but your beliefs can remain the same. So if I have a 0.9 credence and I believe that it will rain tomorrow, and then I check the forecast and see that it's only an 80% chance of rain, I still believe it's going to rain tomorrow. I'm just a little bit less confident. All right. So um, I guess... Uh, I wanted to say that if you, if you wanted to take a little bit longer as far as explaining that, because I think that there's a lot more to break down okay. uh, on that. You can go ahead and, and take your time on that. It's up to you. If not, I can just ask you the next question. Like um, if you had any more there, thoughts. There. Yeah, I mean, I guess I was going to bring it into street epistemology. I kind of kind of in the next few questions. Okay. Um, so... Yeah, maybe, maybe let's do the next question and I'll explain why I think it's relevant. And then if you think something's not clear, we can kind of come back to it. All right. Uh, so yeah, the next question is like, when should you leave a belief like, uh, like behind, like, like we were saying, you know, they ask you all these questions, you don't know how to articulate them and it brings some doubt. When should you believe, leave a belief? Yeah, great. And this is why I think the difference between credence and belief is so important. Um, so when should you believe, leave a belief behind depends on the situation, depends on your evidence for and against that belief, depends on a variety of things. But here's what I think in general is a response when we get evidence against something we believe, believe at least in a lot of situations. What we should do 
is we should lower our credence. But I don't think that automatically always means that we have to give up our belief. So you might think, look, if you believe God exists, maybe you have a commitment to God, maybe you're a Christian, and then you find, you encounter evil in the world and you start learning about the problem of evil and you say, wow, this is a challenge. This is, this is, this is evidence that God doesn't exist because if there's evil in the world, that seems to mean that God either isn't all powerful or isn't all good. And it is a challenge. I think, I think the problem of evil is something that Christians should take very seriously. In response to that, though, you might also say, but I still have good evidence that God exists. Maybe you're aware of some of the arguments for God's existence. Maybe it's evidence more like we were talking about before and religious experiences or testimony, that kind of thing. Um, and so in that situation, what you might do is lower your credence that God exists. Um, but you can continue to believe that God exists. And maybe speaking to Christians really quickly, I think one unfortunate misconception um, is that we have to be 100% sure that God exists or that Christianity is true all the time. And I just don't think that's true. I think we can believe that God exists and that Christianity is true, but not be 100% sure. And in fact, a lot of epistemologists think you should basically, you shouldn't really be 100% sure of anything, or it should only be things like one plus one equals two. And I don't think that means that we're any less committed to God's existence. Um, and, and in fact, I think commitment involves a lot more than belief. It also involves our desires um, and potentially other things as well. And it's okay if you're not 100% certain all the time. In fact, I think that's totally normal. It's nothing to be ashamed of. And I want to encourage people to, you know, embrace, like not embrace the doubt, but take the doubt seriously. You know, don't shrug it off and stick your head in the sand and say, no, 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 I'm hundred percent sure I'm not listening, but like really wrestle with the problem of evil and know that you can continue to believe that God exists and maybe just lower your credence. Let me say, is it okay if I say a few more things? Um, <laughs> so what I want to clarify about this is I'm not defending fideism. Fideism was the view that faith is good because it is irrational. And, you know, maybe on a fideist view, your credence that God exists could be like zero or something, but you should keep believing that God exists. You have like proof that this belief is false and you should continue. And that is not my view. Um, and so I think, look, sometimes when we get a small or a medium amount of evidence against something, that's when we should lower our credence, but we can continue to believe. But if you get a ton of decisive evidence against something, even if you're committed to that thing, sometimes you do need to give up your belief. So here's an example. Let's say, again, I have faith in, let's say, your basketball team. They're about to play a really important game, and I have faith that they'll win, okay? Then one of the members of your starting five gets injured. Okay, so I have some evidence that you might not win. Let's say it's a good player, important for your team. I can continue to believe you'll win. I should maybe just lower my credence a little bit. Okay, let's say instead <laughs> uh, you're well into the game, there's two minutes left, and you're down by 40 points. Okay, I have gone from a little bit of evidence that you won't win to a significant amount of evidence. It's pretty much at this point impossible. And that's a situation where I should both substantially lower my credence and I should give up my belief. So I just want to clarify, in a lot of situations, I think it's totally appropriate just to lower your credence. But when you get proof that a belief is false, you should give up that belief. So I'm not arguing for fideism and I'm not arguing for ignoring evidence. Okay. Um, and, and there's a a comment on the in the chat again uh, that is going to be related to this question. Um, basically, should we wage when it comes to believing in God? Um, is that something that you think is something that we should do as as people uh, if we have perhaps doubts or we're not sure or anything like that? Yeah. So um, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning, one of the things I'm interested in is this argument. Pascal's wager. And basically what Pascal's wager is supposed to show is that it can be rational for you to commit to God or believe in God, even if, remember the credence, your credence that God exists is quite low. And so this is something I do argue for. 
And I think definitely, I think part of the reason belief in God is special here, but I actually think you could make a similar argument for other kinds of commitments that we might have as well. But one reason that belief in God is special here is because if God exists, if there really is a creator of the universe who loves you and wants a relationship with you and created everything, that's super important. And that's someone you should want to know and want to have a relationship with. And so you have a lot to gain if you pursue a relationship with God and God does exist. So because there's this really big potential payoff knowing God, um, and also I think secondarily going to heaven and that kind of thing, um, then yeah, I think we should wager when it comes to believing in God. And one thing that's cool about this is that it means that we can continue to believe in God, even if our credence gets quite low. Um, and maybe at a certain point, if your credence is too low to believe, you can still continue to have that commitment to God and act in certain ways, even if you don't believe. So yeah, I do think we should wager. And I think this has implications for doubting because it means that we can be rational to either believe in God or at the very least remain committed to God, even in the face of serious doubt or low credences. All right. Um, and there, we're going to go into the Q&A and there's uh, a few questions that, that were asked, but um, there's this one comment that I saw at the very beginning and is related to Pascal's wager um, recent conversation with Grant Graham Hoppy. Um, and basically um, what I'm trying to show you here is I'm going to show it on the screen uh, just so so you um, you can see it. And he says um, they he enjoyed your your points uh, in the conversation you had with Grant Hoppy. And then he said when Hoppy made a final statement explaining how it should be best to be a Buddhist on Monday, a Muslim on Tuesday, a Christian on Wednesday, and other gods for the rest of the days of the week. Um, I, I think that uh, his point is that it seems like Pascal's wager at that point becomes uh, you, uh, not very useful. How would you respond to something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. So in that situation, what we were talking about was this idea of hedging your bets. So it means like trying to um, get a good result if you're wrong about something. So um you know, if you hedge your bets when you're investing in stocks, you don't just invest in one stock and put all your money, put all your eggs in that basket, but you invest in a variety of stocks. So even if some do poorly, others will do well. And overall, you'll hopefully end up doing better. And so, you know, one suggestion is what if we hedge our bets when it comes to religion? What if we try to convert to or practice a bunch of religions, um, Buddhist on Monday, Christian on Tuesday, Muslim on Wednesday, or whatever. And I guess my basic response to this was, well, I think it depends. But one problem with this would be, like, let's say you're taking Pascal's wager, and you think Christianity is most likely to be true. Um, and let's say Christianity is a, a religion that requires your, your total devotion then in that case, it would not be rational for you to hedge your bets in this way because you can't actually um, get the, the payoff of Christianity if you're not devoted to it. I mean, there are still, there are still interesting questions here and ways you might hedge your bets. So for example, maybe even if Christianity is not true, God wants you to engage in certain actions that lots of religions prescribe. For example, attending religious services, helping the poor, uh, you know, volunteering at a local soup kitchen, loving and caring about other people, you know, etc. So it might actually be that by choosing a religion and practicing it, you are hedging your bets more than you think. Um, but I think that's also consistent with kind of a total and complete devotion to a particular religion. So whether you should do, do this different religions on different days, I think just depends on your credences and depends on what those religions say you should do. But I think there are definitely situations where that would not be appropriate. Okay. That totally makes sense. Uh, especially in, in a case like Christianity, where it kind of like requires your full devotion to it. If it was something else like, oh, you know, that, that basically says that all roads lead to Rome or lead you to heaven, then in that case, you can be whatever you want in each right. one of the days. Um, okay, so here's uh, one question. Uh, it's basically a comment and a question. Uh, in SE videos, SE videos, 
I have her faith being defined as belief, confidence, and trust. Shouldn't we just use whatever definition the conversation partner uses? Otherwise, we'll be talking past each other. Yeah, completely agree with that. Yeah, no, I think I think that's good. I mean, that's kind of why I said, here's what I would define faith as. And I said, it's kind of a commitment that involves a belief and a desire. But I also said, you know, like I was looking at Peter's Peter Bogushin's book and how he defined faith. And if he wants to insist on defining faith that way, I would say, sure. Yeah, let's let's define faith the way that you want to define it and then talk about the question, given this definition, do we have reason to think that religious believers have faith? And that's where I would, you know, pro we would probably disagree. But yeah, I totally agree. It's super important to be clear about your terms. And I think this is just one thing that is a lesson from philosophy in general, is that one, we might think we're disagreeing when we're not. Um, we might think we agree when we don't, if we're not being clear about what we mean by certain terms. So yeah, I definitely agree that we should be clear about what our terms mean. And yeah, maybe different street epistemologists define faith differently. That's also totally possible. I don't want to be straw manning them or uncharitable to them. I was going by the definitions from this book. But I would be super happy to know that some street epistemologists, I think faith as trust is a great way to define it and a good, a good understanding of faith. And it and also captures the way that faith is uh, not just a religious thing. So if they're defining it that way, um, I think that's awesome. Yeah, and uh, that's basically how uh, it seems to be defined uh, when you, know, you look at the New Testament uh, with the Greek word pistis. Uh, a lot of people miss that, and a lot of Christians don't know that, but that's basically what it is. It, it, it kind of like embodies what the meaning of trust is, um, rather than thinking of like what some people will bring up. I think it's uh, Hebrew, Hebrews 11, where they, they get the definition from there, and they say that it's believing in something that you have no evidence for. But um, it, that's kind of like ignoring the rest of the <laughs> of the, the stuff that came before that and also what the word itself is. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Also, um, sorry, just really quick, believing in things unseen is not the same as believing in something with no evidence because that's assuming that sight is our only source of evidence and it's totally not. So that's just another thing to note. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's good. All right, so I, I have a question here uh, from Samuel Chan. Uh, he said, not sure if this is re a relevant question, but is it possible to have rational or justified beliefs if determinism is true? Um, I guess before you answer that, um, I guess uh, would you like to make a uh, comment as far as like what um, hard determinism will be and, and soft determinism? I don't know if yeah. you want to uh, sure. distinguish the two. Yeah, so um, determinism is basically the view that uh, the past plus the laws of nature determines everything that happens in the future. Um, so everything that happens is, in some sense, has a cause, uh, is determined by things that happen before it. Um, so there's probably a better, more pithy definition out there, but uh, I normally am not talking about free will and interviews, so I can't pull one out, um, off the top of my head. So one of the big debates in the free will literature is about whether free will is consistent with determinism. And compatibilists say that you could have free will even if determinism is true. And libertarians say, no, you can't have free will if determinism is true, and we do have free will. And then um, hard determinists say, uh, we can so they say, Sorry, uh, we can't have free will if determinism is true and we don't have free will. So the question was, is determinism compatible with having rational or justified beliefs, right? Is that right, Santi? I think that's yes. right. Okay, cool, yes. So yeah, super interesting question, partially because, so there's this whole free will debate I was just explaining. That debate is normally about action. So, you know, raising your hand, walking across the room, going for a run, these things that we can do. But there's a whole other really interesting debate to be had about beliefs. Um, do we have control of our beliefs? Could we change our beliefs voluntarily? And one of the positions in this debate is called doxastic voluntarism. That is the view that we have voluntary control over our beliefs. 
Um, and then, <laughs> not to try to make things too complicated, but there's this view that Matthias Stoip defends, and he calls it doxastic compatibilism. And so I think the view is that we can have some kind of free choice or free will with respect to our beliefs, even if determinism is true. Um, so in some ways, that debate about whether we can choose our beliefs is actually sort of separate from the debate about uh, rationality and justification, although they could have implications for each other if you think that in order for a belief to be rational or justified, you have to be able to freely choose it. But actually, a lot of people, in my sense is that at least, a lot of people deny that. So they don't think you have to be able to freely choose a belief in order to be rational or justified. But if you did think that, and you thought that free will required some kind of indeterminism, then you would have a view on which determinism uh, would mean that there couldn't be rational or justified beliefs. But I think um, you could either be a compatibilist or you could just say rationality and justification are sort of a separate matter from whether we have free choices about what to believe. So I hope that's helpful. There's kind of two steps there. One is the relationship between uh, determinism and free choices, and then the other is the relationship between uh, free choices over our beliefs and then rationality and justification. So you would have to take a stand on both of those in order for determinism to be a problem for epistemic rationality. That's awesome. And um, it, 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 the free will topic is so rich. Um, I think that it will take a very long time to be able to 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 look at all the different uh, angles and perspectives that people have, and, and it's just it's huge. If you guys don't know about about the free will show, you guys can uh, go ahead and check that out. Uh, Matt and uh, Dr. Sierra Taylor, they are amazing, and they have all these leading um, philosophers. Like I'm, I'm I'm talking about like top people in the world, uh, and have these discussions about free will and. Uh, determinism and all that stuff. So if you guys want to check that out, go ahead and check that out. It's really good. I'm going to have Dr. Uh, Matt with me on this channel this coming month, and he's one of the uh, the, the hosts of the channel. So that's going to be a good conversation, and, and perhaps uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, Dr. Liz, I have another question over here, and sure. this one is from Zachary Zoller. I hope that I pronounce at least the first name, right? Uh, it says, Liz, do you think that street epistemology could be used by Christians to investigate non-Christian beliefs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it depends on what you think is built into street epistemology. So I think this really basic um, idea of talking to people, asking them questions about why they believe what they believe, trying to get to know them, uh, what did that guy say? I don't want to have a battle with him. I just want to understand him. I think that kind of mindset is awesome and something we should totally uh, do as Christians. I think if we're trying to talk to someone about God or talk to them about Jesus, getting to know them, showing an interest in their life, asking good questions and letting them just tell us about themselves is a super good strategy and something we should definitely do way before we start telling them, well, here's what I believe, or here's my story, or any of that. I mean, it, of course, feel free to share your own story, but I think getting to know the person and letting them talk is great. And again, something I, I think is really valuable about what street epistemologists are doing. So I don't think it's all bad. Um, I think the problem would come in when we start to adopt some of the epistemological assumptions that maybe some of them have. And I don't want to generalize and say every street epistemology has these, but from some of the videos I've watched and some parts of the Manual for Creating Atheist book, they seem to have assumptions that at least I wouldn't agree with about like what faith is and also maybe what counts as, as evidence. They seem to have a pretty narrow definition that mainly includes like scientific evidence. So these are parts of street epistemology I probably wouldn't recommend you adopt. Um, you know, assuming, I, again, I don't want to say all street epistemologists have those, but I have seen those come up when I've looked at street epistemology. So I wouldn't recommend adopting those parts of it. But I think kind of the Socratic method, asking a lot of questions part is great and, and definitely something we can adopt as Christians. Amen. Um, I have a comment here. It says, hello and good morning from Malaysia. Please ensure to like the stream and leave a comment to support us. Amen. Uh, it is morning time over there in Malaysia and I believe it's like 8 a.m. 
uh, and a lot of the people that get to watch this show, uh, they're from Malaysia. So that's really cool. Awesome. <laughs> um, let's see. I do have another question here, and this this one is related to um, one of the comments that I got from the previous video that I did, and I, I just fear um, that it will be a pretty good question for you uh, to answer if you um, I want to do that. Um, and basically what it is is, if a false belief cannot be empirically verified, yet, yet someone is believing is true, how would they ever go about discovering that it's not true? Great question. This lets me talk about philosophy <laughs> and what philosophers do. Because, yeah, I mean, empirical. Okay, so let's just maybe just say what empirically verified may, means. It means you go out in the world and try to learn something that's true. So I could empirically verify whether there's like a duck in my backyard by going out and looking if there's a duck, right? Um, but often empirically verified means using something like the scientific method where we do some experiment to test some hypothesis and then see if it corresponds to the world. It's not, but again, it's not just limited to that. It's a, it's a slightly broader thing where we go out and check the world to see if something's true. Okay. What's interesting is that going out and checking the world is not our only method of learning things. It's not our only method of coming to, to beliefs. Um, and philosophy is what's called a priori. And what a priori means is it's things that we can know or learn before experience, before going out and checking the world. So in a math class, a lot of what you're learning and doing is a priori. You're not going out and checking the world to learn math. You can learn math just by thinking about it. You can see that one plus one equals two a priori. And then there's a debate about what, what all counts as a priori and what all isn't. But arguably, a lot of philosophical debates are ones that we can have a priori. So debates about morality, what actions are right and what actions are wrong, that's not something we go out in the world and discover. That's something we we see or learn about a priori. Also debates about epistemic rationality, what we've been talking about a lot tonight, and the metaphysics and other issues in philosophy. Um, we might get certain concepts from the world, but then we reason and learn about them and come to different conclusions using this a priori method. So hopefully that helps. So, you know, I mean, maybe I could try to give an example. Um, if you had a false belief about morality, let's say, maybe you think animals don't have rights, and then you hear a good philosophical argument, like if humans have rights, then animals must have rights. Humans have rights, therefore animals have rights or something. I just kind of made that up. But uh, if, you, if you see that as an argument, that's a way, let's just say it's true that animals have rights. You could have this false belief, animals do not have rights, um, go through this a priori moral reasoning, and then come to realize that your belief was false and animals do have rights. So hopefully, hopefully that helps, but this is, this is a lot of what philosophers are doing, this kind of a priori reasoning. Does that answer the question? I think it does. Um, okay. Awesome. Yeah. It, I, well, at least, um, you know, I, I, I fully understand where the person is coming from, but then at the same time, because I have studied philosophy and I'm doing a little bit of it, uh, it's just kind of like, you know, I understand uh, the thinking behind the question, but then at the same time, it's like, uh, you know, that I, I feel like, um, there, there is a misunderstanding as far as like, you know, how we can note some things and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I do have, I, I don't know if you want to say something else, but I have two more questions. Okay. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, if you're interested in this like a priori issue, I have a video on my YouTube channel and I think you linked it. Uh, the video is called What is Philosophy? And I talk more about it there. So if you're interested, go check that out. Oh yeah, definitely. And check her website as well. Um, and her website, she has a lot of resources, some of the papers that he, she has published, and uh, also uh, the interviews that you have done, most of them are also on your website, correct? Yeah. And so you, you guys can go and check that out. She has a lot of interviews with different people about different topics, and uh, you definitely can learn a lot from Dr. Liz, and that's why she's one of my favorite philosophers. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so I have a question here from Dan uh, Fallman, and he's asking, Doctor, would you be open to letting a Muslim or atheist tell you about their beliefs and ask follow-up questions without leading them to your beliefs? Yeah, absolutely. Totally. I mean, I think this is a big part of uh, teaching and learning from people and just meeting people is hearing someone, learning about their life. And I don't think it's always appropriate to butt in and say, well, here's all the things I believe. I mean, sometimes that's great. Sometimes it's good and it's nice to have a, a two-way exchange. But yeah, absolutely. I would. I always love to hear why people believe the things they believe. I mean, part of that's why I'm in philosophy. I'm super interested in questions about religion and God and all this stuff. So yeah, the answer is resounding yes. Well, amen. Uh, and Don, Don is a is a great guy. I met him a while back, and uh, we have had a few conversations back and forth. And uh, he's a good guy. Awesome. Um, all right. So I have another question here, and this one is a little bit personal. But uh, <laughs> I did say, hey, I have question. Uh, I have time for one more question, and then I got two of them. Uh, <laughs> but this one is a little personal, Doctor Liz, and this one is from Islam Marin. I hope you know who she is. She is also yeah. Of yeah. <laughs> uh, so she said, how is the married life going? <laughs> That's yeah, no, being married is awesome. It's really great to kind of have a life partner, someone that you can just do things with and bounce ideas off of. And my husband actually is a real estate investor and I've become super interested in uh, just kind of what's all behind that? What's the reasoning behind that? I guess I'm, I'm a little bit of a math nerd. So I like looking at the numbers and just learning about real estate is super cool. And it's a really great investment. So this is obviously not a financial advice podcast, but I have become a huge fan of real estate investing. I think it's super beneficial, uh, probably more beneficial than like investing in the stock market or even, or even a Roth IRA. Although I guess doing both is great too. So, um, so yeah, I definitely advocate for people to look into real estate investing if it's, if you're kind of interested in looking at different ways you might invest. Um, but yeah, married life is awesome. I really enjoy being married. <laughs> Amen. So with that, I will give you my last question. And that would be, uh, if you have any closing thoughts, um, perhaps, uh, share a little bit about the book that you have, uh, uh, that is going to be coming out pretty soon, and some of the things that you that you uh, contributed to, if you want to. Yeah, definitely. So I guess maybe I'll make a few recommendations for like the street epistemology stuff, and then uh, I can talk about my book too. So a couple things in terms of like epistemic rationality and epistemology and how that might interact with street epistemology. I actually have a paper and it's just called Epistemology. You can download it on my website or on Phil Papers. And basically it's an encyclopedia entry overview of the history of epistemology and then what people in epistemology are sort of thinking about and focusing on now. And it's relating it to theology and philosophy of religion. So if you're interested in like an overview of epistemology, it's pretty short. That's uh, one thing to look at. Um, if you're interested in faith, I sort of mentioned this already, but I have a paper called The Nature and Rationality of Faith. And what I basically try to argue in that paper is that uh, we can let the other side define faith, but for every definition that they give, either faith is actually not epistemically uh, irrational, or uh, there's no good reason to think that religious people actually have faith. So if you're interested in sort of faith and whether faith is irrational, you should check that paper out. And Santi and I did an interview on that paper too. Um, for street epistemology, more specifically, I thought the discussion between Tim McGrew and Peter Bogashan was really good. So um, you should check that out. And then also, I think we mentioned already the interview with Daniel Ray that was done on this channel, I thought was also really helpful. Um, so that was a little bit about the topics for today. <coughs> Excuse me. The book that we have coming out is actually about applied ethics. So applied ethics is sort of really practical ethical questions we might ask in everyday life. And I'm actually, let's see if I can pull it up super quickly. Uh, I was gonna pull up the table of contents so I could just tell everyone all the topics we cover. Actually, here, here it is. So we basically, we cover six topics. I can't always remember all of them off the top of my head. Um, we cover abortion, we cover animal ethics, we cover environmental ethics, we cover poverty and charity, we cover punishment, and then the last topic is disability. 
And so what our goal is in this book, I have, I read it, I wrote it with three other people, Tyrone Goldschmidt, Dustin Crummett, and Rebecca Chan. And what we do is we try to introduce these topics, introduce both sides of the debate, and then let you make the decision. So our goal is not to convince you of any particular view, but just to try to make the philosophical arguments accessible and easy to understand and help you have a more informed opinion about some of these questions. So um, it should be coming out at the end of 2021. If you look on my YouTube channel, I have a video where I sort of show some of what the book's gonna look like and some other of the features. And I'll put on that video when there's an Amazon link, there isn't one right now, but I'll put it on that video. So I'm super excited for that book. I think it'll be, I hope it'll be really helpful for people and just help people like think more clearly about these, these tough issues. Um, and then, yeah, I guess like the final thing to say is I kind of already said it. My, if you want to learn more about me, my YouTube channel, I think is linked in the description. And then my website is liz-jackson.com. All right. And with that, everybody, thank you so much for being here tonight, uh, all of you. Uh, don't forget to check out some of the other shows that we have within this channel, Explain International. Uh, there's uh, two, three more shows, uh, and some of them deal with the Old Testament, theology, and also um, textual criticism, early church history, and stuff like that. So it's really helpful if you guys are interested in uh, a broader view of apologetics and stuff like that. And uh, as always, we're going to be having interviews with experts from different fields and finding truth. And uh, thank you all uh, so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Dr. Liz. Um, Thanks for having me. This was a really great conversation. Amen. And with that, we'll let you guys go. Thank you again. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to Explain International. I am going to be transitioning from Finding Truth to Explain, Explain International. So don't forget to do that. And we'll see you guys later.